Hi, I'm Macomb County Treasurer Ted Wabi, and welcome to our program, Inside Macomb. Today I have as my guest, Dr. Christopher Nichols. Nicholas. Nicholas, okay, I'm sorry. I, I'm, I'm not good at reading. <laughs> and uh, uh, now you're with, with McLaren Macomb? That's correct. Okay. All right, well, tell us a little bit about your background. Well, um, as you stated, I currently now basing my practice right over by McLaren Macomb, literally office across the street, but didn't start there. Um, I came into the greater Detroit area back in 1985 where I started my undergrad down at Wayne State. And I got a couple bachelor's degrees there in chemistry and biology before I went off to Michigan State for med school uh, at their College of Osteopathic Medicine. Um, came back to the area where I was up in Pontiac, so Pontiac Osteopathic, which is now McLaren, Oakland. I uh, did my last two years of medical school, which is more the clinical setting in the hospital, and then stayed there for another five years for my postgraduate training in orthopedic surgery. Um, finished that in 2001. Joined a group right in that same vicinity based out of Auburn Hills, at that time a large multi-specialty group, and was there until more recently where I want to get back in the home of the community I live in. Uh, I live in St. Clair Shores. I'm in Macomb County. And so now I got the opportunity to kind of come back home. So just recently I've moved back in the area and kind of focusing my practice here. Well, good. We're glad you're here. As I am too. Uh, now, uh, what, what sort of procedures do you do and what kind of patients that you treat? Well, I'm a general orthopedic surgeon, which means I do a wide variety of orthopedic needs. So I'm not the guy that's going to specialize on the right great toe. Um, I'll take care of your right great toe, but I'll take care of a lot of other things too. So as an orthopedic surgeon, we're going to be dealing with traumatic type of injuries, so broken bones, fractures, muscle, ligament, tendon injuries. Um, joint replacements are becoming an increasing need for the patient population, and that's something I'm doing more and more of, especially knee replacements, is something that's just kind of found me and it's something I enjoy. Um, a lot of sports medicine is oriented to the field that we go into, so that's where a lot of arthroscopic measures outpatient procedures where we're using small, non-invasive or minimally invasive types of techniques to help people are kind of my tools, the things that I'm doing on a daily, daily basis. What about backs? Backs, no. Backs, especially in, in larger areas like this, largely has become a very subspecialized area. So most people that do a lot of care with the back and the spine are fellowship trained in concentrating just in that area or a large portion of their focus is in that area. Uh, local high school students and athletes are about to start football season. Is there any advice you give them to help limit injuries they might get? Well, there's a few things you can think about. Um, some of it, it depends on how far out we are from that season. So there's certainly some things that can be done in the off season in their conditioning. Um, we know more and more. So with the right type of guidance in preparation, that can help eliminate some of the injuries right there. Then there's a phase as we're ramping up for that season. So the, right now we're all we're doing the conditioning, the hard work leading right up to it. Um, and the things with that is, you know, there's some things associated just with that time. It's August, it's hot. So there's the things that we know. We need to be hydrated appropriately. We need to prep, prepare for those. And we have to listen to our body. Um, there's gonna be aches, there's gonna be pains, there's gonna be bruises that are just part of the sport. That's okay. But we need to be aware and, and not ignore that pain it's a little bit more or there was that specific injury we can identify and it's continuing that's when you need someone looking at it whether it's that trainer that therapist that's associated with that program or seeing someone like me to make sure it isn't a sign of something more significant yeah. um, and then we can get into a lot of other things too uh, with these athletes as to how do we prepare or strategies of how you do things how do you cut how do you move reduce the incidence of ACL injuries and some of these injuries that are so prevalent in a sport such as football. Um, you know, the other thing that's starting to be, we're starting to become more aware of, we seeing the orthopedic community or sports medicine, is we're seeing a unique development of injuries that we didn't see before that are a process of, you know, now we, we tend to say, what is your sport? Not, what do you play in this season? And you have these athletes that their body never gets a chance to rest or recover from the rigors of that sport. And we get these overuse type of injuries that are much more prevalent than they were a generation or a couple generations before. So being conscious of that, looking at an overhead hand throwing athletes, pitch counts, different things to try that, or taking a break from that sport and doing something else is probably something we need to be thinking about. Well, that's interesting because uh, 
I'm sure a lot of uh, it's never been addressed in that particular way before. You know, it really has, and it's something we're trying to come up with some consensus on some of these things, and and trying to give some good information and guidance. Maybe that's what we got to start teaching parents to. Uh... Well, I think I think that they do have to be directly involved, and I think sometimes we're giving them mixed messages. You know, they want, like any parent, you want to do the best and give your, your child the tools to excel in something they enjoy. Yeah, right. And so it's with the best of intentions, but sometimes we need to take a break from that. Or you can, it doesn't mean you forget it for three months and you play Xbox. There's other physical things you can do. There's things that may help that sport, but in a different way, putting the body through different things or concentrating on something else. Do you even get a mental break from that? I think that there's a real value to that. Well, it, it, uh, that's good, good to, uh, to discuss those kind of things. I think the more their parents are aware of this thing, they, they can be a guiding light to the kids, too. Absolutely. Uh, you've had a lot of experience, as we were talking earlier, with knee replacements. When would a person start to consider a knee replacement? Good question, and one I get asked a lot. And, and it's not uncommon for patients to come to my office saying, do I need a knee replacement? Or when do I need a knee replacement? So the first thing is to identify, is it an arthritic condition? Because um, that's what a knee replacement is. We're replacing a worn out joint, if you will. And, and then it's, it's a matter of assessing how advanced is that arthritic condition? Are the symptoms a person having just because of the arthritis or are there are other things too? And that's all gonna be part of what we determine what things can we do and how, how close are you to that being the solution. Once we know that it is arthritis and it's advanced to the point where that starts to become one of the, the options on the table, if you will, that's a matter of when is it right for that individual person. And, and what I would tell people is when we have clearly a diagnosis of advanced arthritis and that arthritis is either keeping you from doing the things that you need to do, your daily activities, or it's keeping you away from the things that are your passions, the things you want to do. It's affecting your quality of life. Then you need to seriously consider is replacing that joint the right thing and the right time for it to give you an opportunity to have those things back. And that's what a joint replacement in many cases can do is give you, if not all those things back, a lot of those things back. When you, when, uh, when you do a knee replacement, what do you, uh, what is specifically done? In what do you do? Yeah. Um, you know, a lot of people, I think, envision almost like you just go chop, chop, you pull it out, and you pop in a new one. That's what I would think. And that's what I think. <laughs> you know, I think a more accurate way of thinking of it is it's like a resurfacing, okay? So when a joint wears out, what's worn out is those cartilage surfaces, those surfaces that come together. So you hear people talking about being bone on bone. Right. And then what yeah. they're referring to is when you take an x-ray of an arthritic knee uh, or a knee in general, you see a space between the two bones. Well, that space isn't, they're not floating apart. Part of that is the cartilage on the end of the bones. Well, as that wears away, you see the bones come together. And that's where bone to bone, that phrase comes from. So basically, what we need to do is bone on bone hurts. Metal on plastic doesn't hurt. So you're taking away those worn ends of the bone. So if this is your, the end of your thigh bone, your femur, if we're taking away, kind of cutting away around that there, removing that, and now putting a metal replacement of that, that's more what we're doing there. We do that on the other end, and then between those two surfaces, that space is made up with, think of it like a durable plastic mm -hmm. that goes in between the two. So that's more accurately what we do. And, and these are very precise cuts that met the, meet the dimensions of that piece that again meets the dimensions of your knee. Um, so I think that's a more accurate way of, a, of, of visioning it. The ligaments on the side of the knee are preserved. A lot of you is preserved as much as we can. Some things now are artificial, and that's some of the things that are going to be a little different than the knee you started off with in life, and that's why you have to really critically look at how is it affecting you, how much function has been lost, and what can we now give back to you. Now, well, that, that particular uh, operation... Uh restore uh, uh, function yeah it, it can do an excellent job of doing that and well, certainly that, that's our goal yeah. um, it can be a very rewarding procedure it's it's a fun one for me to do because you can make a big impact on people um, and certainly that's my goal for them um, it can give you a lot of those things back are there some things that seem a little different absolutely it's artificial it's the best that we can do but we can do a pretty good job um, and they can be pretty durable. So that's another question I get asked a lot. Well, how long is it going to last? 
Um, and you know, more current literature would show us that a lot of these knee replacements can still be going, 90% can still be going strong at 20 years out. So oh, for a lot of people, this may be a one-time deal. But it's also good to know that if it does wear out or something goes wrong where it's not functioning as well, it's not like you got no more options revisions, redoing or revamping or doing further things to s restore that function once again, a lot of times, the majority of times, can still be done. Well, see, that's the good part of it, yeah. That's the good part of it. We can still help you even in that situation. Well, that's tremendous. I mean, when you start look, start talking as, as much as 20 years out, that's... <laughs> sure. Uh, what would happen if someone just ignores this pain? How would it get worse? Well like we said, arthritis is a wearing away. It's not going to grow back. So we know predictably things are going to worsen over time. So the problems that you can get into if you wait too long um, is one, you're going to become more and more sedentary. You're going to be less healthy because you can't do anything or you become more and more restricted in what you can do. So now you become a poor surgical candidate. Um, and, and you've just given up so much of you. You start changing who you are. Do you really want to do that um, when there's a, a clear solution to offer you? So, so those are some of, the, some of the problems you can encounter. And then it can even get to some cases if you wait long enough and there's been enough advancement in the progression of the loss and the changes to the knee that it becomes more complicated. You have more deformity. It may be unstable where it's causing you risk for fall or other injuries. It may be more difficult to attain what we want for you. Um, so, you know, when you see an orthopedic surgeon about an arthritic knee wondering if you need a knee replacement, hopefully they're not just gonna say, ha, all right, and they're gonna put you there. They're gonna really assess you, what your goals, what you're hoping to get out of it, and how do we attain those, whether it's a knee replacement or something else. That's the appropriate way of treating that patient. Well, that sounds logical to me. Uh, the uh are there any alternatives to a total knee replacement? There's a lot of alternatives. Which ones are applicable to you, the patient, depends on where you are down that spectrum. So when I see a patient the first time, first we have to listen. You know, Sir, Sir William Osler said, said years ago that if you listen to a patient long enough, they'll give you the diagnosis. They'll tell you what's wrong. So I listen. You need to hear how it's affecting them and how it's creating problems in their daily life. Then you have to look at what's there physically, their exam, their x-ray findings. Once you've determined those things, now you can get an idea, is it arthritis? Is arthritis only part of the problem? And where are they at in the progression of it? So in the earlier phases, there's a lot lesser things that may be all you need, or at least at this time. It may be certain medications to control the inflammation. It may be that, gee, you know, I'm less active, things change, I've gained more weight, Maybe we can come up, so work around that where we can lose some of that weight. It's a weight-bearing joint. It's going to have an impact on you. Okay. There's different types of injections, sometimes therapy, bracing. There's a lot of things before you even get to the point of surgical procedures to your knee. And then once we get to surgery, that's a whole other realm. And yes, there's knee replacements, but there's other procedures like partial replacements. So some people don't have the whole knee wearing out, just a part of it. So maybe you only replace that part of it. Keep more of what they started off with, a more natural-feeling knee. Um, so it's, you can imagine, it's pretty individualized and there's a lot of time and sharing and talk before we ever come to a conclusion of, do you need a surgery or what's the right treatment course for you? Uh, you mentioned before the art of medicine. What do you mean by that and how does it apply to your specialty? The art of medicine. So, and I, and I medicine is not a black and white field. It's a lot of shades of gray. So. It drives some of my engineer patients crazy because they live in a very analytical, you know, you measure with a micrometer, it's very clear, it's precise, we're working with numbers. Um, the human body isn't that way. So you, you, you have to have an appreciation for the individual, where they're at in that disease process, their arthritis, and what things are likely to help and to what degree. And it will be variable that you can do sometimes the same thing or treatment, and it doesn't always respond the same to every patient. So that's where there's a little bit of 
the art of it and learning these things and, and communicating and being able to sense what your patient's experiencing and applying all that to get them the very best outcome. And I think it is an art. And I think that's also why we say we, we practice medicine because we're always trying to get better. We're never done. We're never satisfied with this is the very best we can ever do for a patient. We can do some good things for people nowadays. Absolutely, that I know. I've gone through a few things that they've done for me. <laughs> but, <laughs> but even as much as we can do now, we look forward to the things we can even maybe do better in the future. Yeah, well, the medicines, uh, I mean, the, the, that's the, uh, the whole deal and research and all the things that go on. There are a lot of things that help medicine advance. Uh, has there been any change in the technology of when you do the surgery as opposed to what used to be done before? Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, it's, it's kind of a fun field to be in. And, and this is true for a lot of areas of medicine. There's a lot of advancements. But both from the nuts and bolts of how you do the surgery is changing and evolving. Um, now we, we're exploring you know, using techniques like robotic assistance. So you may hear in the area here talking about macoplasty, which is something that is offered at McLaren Macomb. And what that is, is the utilization of a robot assisting you in performing uh, partial knee replacements, and there's some applications in hip replacements as well, trying to see how much can we mesh the human factor with the precision of the non-human factor to get the very best outcome. Um, there's other things such as where we do more customization of the knee replacement, not so much in the design of the implant, but how we go about doing it. So using MRIs or CAT scans to create three-dimensional models of that person's knee and then guides that guide us in the positioning of those cuts or that placement using that data. Um, you'll hear you know, a, a phrase that's used a lot now with a lot of interest is minimally invasive surgery. And, and really what you're talking about there is not how long is the scar, although part of it might be reflecting that. It's what did you do under the skin? How much can we not disrupt muscles, tendons, other structures, and, and still do what we need to do and do it accurately, um, which may be, make for an easier recovery. Um, there's been a lot of advancements in technique, instrumentation, ability to do that, that's evolved over time, where now, you know, 10 years ago, I might talk more to a person about, hey, I think you're a candidate for a minimally invasive knee replacement. Now, everybody is a candidate for at least some aspects of it. Maybe they're not all the same for every patient, but I've comfortably just applied it as to how it's applicable to that patient to everyone. So that's some of the more, more clear-cut things that have advanced as far as just the technique-wise and how you do the surgery. And then we can get into other realms which are really interesting as to just the technology and harnessing the own person's biology. And this is where we get into the fringes of where is stem cell therapy and platelet-rich plasma and these things, where is it going to lead us? And right now we probably have as many questions as answers. It's pretty exciting stuff but the answers aren't all there yet. Is there, uh, is there anything patients can do to pre-op to help their recovery? Definitely. So once you've decided and we've determined that you're having a knee replacement or a partial knee replacement or something of that nature, um, are there things that you can do to get yourself ready? And there's several. One is be educated. You know, part of the problem when you go into any type of surgical procedure is, is the fear of the unknown. So, you know, we've identified that courses that teach you about what you're going to go through, teach you some of these things, are definitely helpful. Makes it go smoother. Takes away the unknown factor. You already expect these things. Um, some people will be good candidates for possibly some type of therapy or exercise or conditioning, preparing themselves for it. Maybe it's getting your upper body stronger because you're going to need a walk or some type of assist device at first. Um, so yeah, you're able to use those things. Maybe it's teaching you how do you use these types of things because you haven't before. So it isn't all new and having to be learned at that same time. Um, so some of these things can be helpful. And then there's back to, you know, we mentioned earlier about, you know, weight loss, these types of things. And it's, and it's not easy. It's not easy for anyone. And now you've got something that further, further affects your ability to be physically active. So it's even more challenging. But there's still opportunities there. And we can maybe help you. Um, and then optimizing yourself medically. So that's where, like a lot of things, and especially these types of things, it's a real team approach. I'm just one part of the team. I'm a big part of the team in the OR, but there's a lot of other big, important team members before it your primary doctor being one of the big ones. So they're medically optimizing you, making sure that 
you're as healthy and as prepared for this as you can be. So these are all things that need to be happen well before you get to you. You get to me and you get to the OR. How much function can a post-op patient have once they're fully healed? They can have excellent function. So it's not expected that we're making you give up a lot of things because you had a knee replacement. It's more expected we're giving you back a lot of things because you had a knee replacement, is I think how you think about it. Um, you have to be realistic. It is artificial. Um, you're, you're not going to be a rock climber. You're not going to be a marathon runner after a knee replacement, or at least I don't recommend it, and you're not going to get the 20 years out of it probably if you do those things. But being able to, to bike, to swim, to golf, to do a lot of the things that you probably were already giving up are definitely things that you should be able to do. You should have good motion to your knee. These are all things that between the techniques, the design of the implants, and the therapy protocols that we have, we can predictably attain for you. However, there's going to be a little bit of tough love with it, too. So I want you to get the best knee you can, and I want you to be, have an outcome that you're happy with. So there's going to be that personal effort. You know, we can set you up. We can give you a good knee. We can do a technically precise surgery, but then it's going to be the hard work of the therapy and the things that we ask of you. Um, that's part of the deal. Well, but if you do it, those yeah. things, yeah. you'll be happy. Well, that's what you're looking for. You're looking Absolutely. To, to get there, and and to do that, you've got to you know you've got to be prepared sure. to walk the mile yep. to get it done. But if you're willing to, it can be a very rewarding procedure. Is is the uh, is the uh, uh, what, what what is it a deficiency in a person? Uh, is makeup that causes this knee stuff, or is the it arthritis? Just because you wore it out, or sure. Um, yes and yes. Uh, so everybody doesn't get arthritis for exactly the same reason or formula. There's definitely a genetic component. So you'll see, yeah, dad, grandpa all had arthritis. So certainly there's, there's that piece. Um, there's the things that you've subjected that joint to over time. Little injuries or traumas along the way that have caused their little bits of damage that just catch up with you over time. Once cartilage is lost, it doesn't regenerate, it doesn't grow back. We don't have the, really the ability in general terms. I mean, there are restoration techniques for isolated things that we can do, and I can talk for quite a bit longer just on those types of techniques. Um, but there's, there's a progression of these things. So there's that. There are certainly some people that have a much clearer role of an anatomic variation, the way they're made, as you stated, that are a bigger factor in why they get arthritis or arthritis in certain areas. Perfect example is the hip, that within the orthopedic community, there's been a lot of interest and a lot more attention, probably in the last 10 to 15 years, especially of what's called femoral acetabular impingement, a mismatch between the ball and the socket, that over time, this mismatch sets that person up for probably getting arthritis or arthritis at an earlier age. So that's opening up new revenue, or revenues, but new, new avenues of maybe we can preemptively identify some of these and do things earlier before they get that. So there's a lot of different things that all together put you, you in my office. mentioning arthritis. Uh, right. Is that the pr predominant issue with knees? It is, at least when you're talking about the person that's in need of a knee replacement is it's arthritis. It can be different forms of arthritis. Usually when I say arthritis, we're talking about osteoarthritis. So that's the, the run of the mill arthritis that most people get. But there are different variations. So that's where certainly even comes more genetics and that's so when you're talking about inflammatory arthritis, like rheumatoid arthritis, psoriatic arthritis, these things. They behave a little different way and they have bigger parts of that as their factor and you kind of were born with it or you had a risk factor in that. Um, and treatments are different medically or things leading up to a joint replacement, but those patients will need a knee replacement too. Um, you know, for the patient, the fact that they have an arthritic knee and they need help is universal. Those different aspects of arthritis though are important for me to understand because it may have some changes in the application of what's the best treatment for you or what's the best form of knee replacement for you. Uh, and just listening to some of the uh, information you're giving us, uh, there seems to be a great advance in the technique of doing this surgery as it was years ago. There is. Um, and, even re and even years ago, 
they were getting great outcomes. So if you think about that, and now all these advances in how we do it, and what they're made of, and the design to try to replicate and get closer to where you were, that's pretty encouraging stuff. Yeah. That if anything, it shouldn't scare you away. It should make you that much more interested in saying, hey, this may be a real good option that I should explore. Well, like I say, we, know, we all know that, that uh, uh, medicine has made a dynamic uh, change in the last few years for the better in terms of techniques and right. things to, to, uh, to uh, I, I know, uh, I, I remember years ago when people had bypass surgery and you were, I had a five-way done, I was in the hospital, I was out I think in three days or four days. Sure. And uh, I went back to work a week after that. Yeah. And the other, before, you had to lay around for almost three months before you could. Uh, Absolutely. Yeah. You know, knee replacements, people might be in, have been in the hospital for a week or more uh, a generation or two ago. And now they're looking at and successfully doing them for the right patient as an outpatient. Um, and it's not just because the insurance is pushing them out the door quicker. It's because it can be done and done right. There's a lot of planning and things, but that's just how things are evolving yeah, for us. That's, uh, well, doctor, I want to, first of all, I'm happy to meet you. I haven't met you before. And, and uh, certainly uh, I hope this has been all you people out there who may need a knee replacement. Sounds to me like Dr. Nichols is the guy you better come and see. I'd be absolutely happy to see him. But but uh, I'm glad you're with McLaren Macomb, and I'm glad everything's worked out with you. And uh, certainly we'll get you back in the future and see how things are well, how well things are going. And, Love it. But uh, thank you for being on the show today. Well, thank you for having me. I really appreciate it.